Thanks for tuning in to the Move Mind podcast. My guest this episode is Stuart Cooper, a BJJ black belt under Lucio Sergio de Santos and head of the BJJ program at Diaz Combat Sports. He's also a videographer, hailing from the mean streets of Preston in the UK and now living in Vancouver, Canada. Mr. Stuart, thanks for coming on the show, mate. Oh, pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Absolute pleasure too, mate. Yeah, awesome. Let's start then with the origin story for jiu-jitsu. I don't actually know this about you, despite uh, having met you last year. I don't actually know where your journey with jiu-jitsu started. So maybe we could start there, mate. Where does White Belt Stuart begin? It actually started, I was at university and I think I was just coming to the end of my degree um, in southeast London. So I was about 22 at this time. And then me and my housemates, we actually just by chance caught uh, the ultimate fighter and we started watching a few of the UFCs. Um, so that's kind of where it all began. I, it was the first time I saw MMA. So <clears throat> just from watching the UFC, I had a big because I've always been into sport. So I've always wanted to try some kind of martial arts. So at the time I was into uh, marathon running, just general gym stuff, weightlifting. So <clears throat> after seeing the UFC, I asked a few people, what, what, it, what is it? What is the UFC? And they said, it's MMA. So um, a few of the, I was actually at the time working at a local um, Bannatine's health club, just on the reception. And there's a few personal trainers there. And I asked them, is there any gyms in London that actually teach MMA? Um, and one of them actually was uh, into Muay Thai boxing. So he invited me down to his local gym. And that's where I first started martial arts was I did Muay Thai boxing for about, for about four weeks. But it was, there was an MMA class on afterwards. So after about four weeks of doing Muay Thai, I actually got the, <clears throat> the confidence and the courage to go to the MMA class because I was a little bit intimidated by the, the people that were in there. So finally went down to my first MMA class and just kept getting taken down, submitted by people half my size. And that's what really like grabbed me was I, I really enjoyed the stand up, but it was feeling helpless on the ground, like literally people half my size pinning me on the ground, getting me arm bars, triangles. And I asked them, what is this ground stuff? And they're like, this is jujitsu. And I'm like, right, can I just do jujitsu separate? And like, yeah, there's a London Fight Factory. So um, I just stopped doing Muay Thai, stopped doing MMA and just focused solely on jiu-jitsu after that. So I started, um, I got my degree and then I stayed down in London for a couple of months and I just trained jiu-jitsu twice a day, every day from, from day one. And I was probably down there for about two months and then I had to move back up to, uh, to my folks' place, back up in Preston and start looking for a real job. And I think at this time is when the recession hit. So it was really hard to find a job at this time. So just to <clears throat> keep myself busy, I joined up a local jiu-jitsu gym in Preston. And that was my professor, uh, Lucio Sergio de Santos. And then that was it. That's where my jiu-jitsu journey began. You know, I just got hooked in it like right away. So um, <clears throat> at this time, I was supposed to be looking for jobs. <laughs> but I was just training jiu-jitsu. Jiu and my parents were not really happy about this. Like, so I kept on nagging me to go and find a real job and I'm wasting my time doing the, you know, doing this hobby. So I would pretend to go out and do interviews. I would like get a shirt and tie on and go out in the car and say, oh, I've got an interview today for a job, but I would actually have my rash guards in the car on my gi and just go straight to training. <laughs> Amazing. And did so, you start, you started with the gi and no gi together or did you start I started, gi first? Actually, it started with no gi. Um, because right. I was in London, it was like MMA, like kind of no gi jiu jitsu, like grappling, right. yeah. and that's still kind of what I wanted to do. But I went up to Preston, it was just solely the gi, so that's where I really, yeah, just I fell in love with the gi. So, yeah, I was pretty much, and we only did no gi once a week, but um, yeah, I stayed in Preston, um, training like twice a day, every day, up until purple belt. And it was when I got my purple belt that's when I actually took off traveling to Brazil. And then actually made the decision, right, I'm going to dedicate myself to this. Wow. Yeah, it's usually the crossroads comes around the blue purple stage, yeah. doesn't it? Is this going to be an integral part of your lifestyle or is this just going to be a hobby that you do maybe once a week? That's where people decide usually, isn't it? Yes. Or yeah. quit or quit. Yeah, I kind of knew like from Blue Belt, but, um, you know, your parents always and your family always want the best for you, but they couldn't really understand. They didn't think I could make a living from it. Yeah, but um, you know, I just I loved it so much that I knew that's what I wanted to do. But they wanted me to find a real job, you know, work in an office or you know something realistic. You know? Yeah, because yeah, telling them I could make a living from jujitsu was you know I didn't really have a reference at that time. You know, it yeah. was, jiu jitsu wasn't 
like like it is today because this is maybe 14 15 years ago or something yeah so you didn't have flow grappling you didn't have like people like gordon ryan gary tone making these making a lot of money you know yeah no so totally. things have changed a lot yeah it has evolved a ton and uh careers are now synonymous with with jiu-jitsu aren't yeah. they? when you began in the gi was it encouraged and sort of mentioned to you that gi should be kind of the primary focus and no gi was just a kind of a thing that you did or were you did you know at some point that the gi was going to take not a back seat but the no gi would be more interesting to you or did, were you just doing both for just to see how you go yeah it was mate it was it was a gracie bar school at the time and it was it was mainly it was just all, all gi but we did do one uh one no gi class in the first day i think it was but I would always look for look forward to that that Thursday. So right away, I always like the nogi just you know has suited my style a lot more because you have to be. I like to move fast and you know be uh, more explosive. You know the gear is a lot slower. You know. Yeah, it is much so, slower, isn't it? The friction. Yeah, Do you think people yeah. should in now that jujitsu has evolved and the game has evolved, but the gear is still the gear and no gear is still gear. Do you think people should still start? with the gi or do you think it's not actually relevant if you want to be let's say a no gi player do you even need to do the gi what do you think yeah as i say it's quite a i don't know it's a good question it's a, it's a touchy subject as well with uh right you know there's some uh, traditional players but I, I think you could just so like i think that the as as we evolve the two are going to move further and further apart right so now i'm really focused solely on no gi you know i do a little bit of gi every now and again but just because how much there is to learn in Nogi, because of John Danaher, Gordon Ryan, there's all these, uh, there's this new system, this new way of learning, all these subsystems to learn. And it's just, the levels are like, when I got my black belt in 2015, that's like a purple belt of today's standards, you know, just because how technical it's become. So I find it, it's a little bit overwhelming to like, all the time I'm studying Nogi, you know, looking for new stuff, looking for the new leg entanglements, the new entries, um, the new setups and then gi is a whole other world and I actually don't have time I don't have enough time in the day to start studying worm guard squid guard all that stuff so I just rather get really good at no gi you know yeah for myself so it really it's good to do both for sure you know but yeah. uh, for me for myself I, I would be happy just doing no no gi for the rest of my life <laughs> yeah yeah I understand I think it's one of those things it's um you can specialize later on can't you i think once yes. you've got the privilege yeah. once you've put in the hours choose then when you want to specialize because i think in the beginning a general approach is actually beneficial my stance is i think everyone should do two years in the gi when they start yeah i think that's right yeah and because it does teach you right you know, exactly it teaches you yeah it's more traditional but it, it, the pedagogy of learning and achieving stripes and belts it's kind of cool if you're new to that, if you haven't gone through the judo pedagogy or if you haven't gone through any other kind of martial art or grading system. It teaches you, you know, hopefully under a good lineage or a good school, what hard work equates to and yeah. that you do have a long way to go. And then it does give you some sort of point of reference for just how infinite the galaxy of jujitsu moves is and how little you actually know. And you're also in a slower more friction based game that can allow you to think a little bit and just learn the kind of the rules of engagement and i think it takes a while i'm talking from a perhaps more of a recreational hobbyist point of view um i only recently picked up the gi again after a I don't know, 17 18 year layoff i did two years as a kid and then come back and i think it's just not and for me again it's not going to be my primary focus no gi is the primary focus but to have it running in the background and just appreciate it for the art that it is even if i don't want to take it um you know to a massive competitive level i think it's a cool thing it's just a cool art form isn't it it's one to be respected and treasured and hopefully yeah. one that you could do into your older ages maybe yes but i think as i get older and i slow down and i get more injuries i'll probably appreciate the gear a lot more and i'll probably fall and look at that again because you can you can slow it down like let's say like in my late 40s and i'm rolling with some killer you know purple 22 year old purple bell that's just fast and booming all the place i want to get a gear and like pin him down <laughs> yeah hold him still so when you yeah. started even at london like uh, the london fight factory and then again under lucio did you have any athletic background did you have any sporting background or did you just um, like sports and just and needed to get moving 
Yeah, I did. I always, I played for the school football team. Um, I was just always always into sport. I was always out. Like I was never someone that would stay in and play computer games or watch films. I'm not like I've got too much energy. I have, I have a hard at school. Actually, I have a hard time focusing in class. Um, I just I always excelled in sports or anything art like um, creative, like arts or technology. But when it came to mathematics, you know that kind of that kind of science. Like my brain just doesn't work like that. So. Um, yeah, and I picked up the jiu-jitsu very fast because playing know. football, playing rugby, rollerblading, skateboarding, I was always into always into something. You know, I went from one hobby to another hobby to another hobby. Before I got into jiu-jitsu, I was actually, I first got into weightlifting when I was 16 and then started lifting weights, started getting big and strong. And then I'm like, right, what do you do then? You just get stronger and stronger. Then what? So then I discovered, mar- like I got into marathon running and then. I did a marathon in Amsterdam and then it's like, right, you get good, you know, you, you get better at, you know, you can run a marathon and you can beat your best time. But then where does it go from there? And then I discovered jujitsu and it's like, you won't find a single black belt on the planet that can say, like, I've learned everything, you know, I've mastered it all. So when I found jujitsu, it's like, right, this is something you can't ever master. It's always, it's exciting. Every, every day you go, you're learning something new, you know? Yeah. So that's what really, I think that's what grabs people at jujitsu. It's, um, yeah, it is very addictive in that sense. Yeah, you know? endless, right? You can see progress if you look for it, but yeah. also relative to the end point, there is no end point. So it's like you can't really get bored. And for anyone that struggles yeah. with um, the more, let's say, classroom-based learning, I think jiu-jitsu is the perfect antidote to that because it's a yeah. uh, involvement, like uh, physical learning, right? It's a kinesthetic intelligence yeah. that you need and there's no end to it so unlike it's a yeah, p- no computer end, game yeah. that you can never complete right it's um yeah it's very social as well like it, like a marathon running i did enjoy running like uh, uh like all sports but it's like you're by yourself you yeah. know same weightlifting you go to the gym by yourself maybe you go with, with a few friends and lift weights together there's something different about jiu-jitsu you know yeah, yeah. um that's what i love about being here in canada right now i've got a good group of students and it's like a social club you know everyone knows everyone and we're all learning together and yeah, yeah. that's a pow- yeah. that's a powerful environment for, yeah. for learning and for enjoyment no, definitely that's yeah. that's that's the beauty of our our sport so you went to brazil when you hit purple belt then what was the yeah. The motivation there and what did that that trip look like because that sounds pretty cool so uh when i was i was trained jiu-jitsu twice a day every day and i like made like you know i wanted i was started to win a lot of regional national tournaments in the uk i was doing really well um you know on the local circuit and i was going to carry on competing but then i had a freak accident in uh, one of the uh, seminar at the gracie bar of preston where I, I, from what I remember, it's a bit of a blur. I jumped on someone's back and they kind of tripoded up and tried to shake me off the front. I went to post my left hand on the ground and my arms snapped back the opposite way. So it was like a straight dislocation. I was lucky, fortunate enough, there was no break. They had to pop it back in, but I was out for a year. So all the ligaments and tendons were damaged. I remember like just waking up and you know, my arms in a cast. It's like purple and black. It, it took a long time, a good year before I was back training maybe a little bit long before I got confidence back in it but in that year I couldn't I had no job jiu-jitsu was my life so just for something to do that it was a bit of a blessing in disguise so I picked up a little video camera and just started filming training started filming um, you know all the guys rolling with each other go to the local tournaments and make little highlights of the team competing and um didn't really think of anything of it just doing it for fun just to keep my mind busy and then one of my uh, teammates at Gracie Barra Preston his name's Dale Hesketh um he was getting married so he saw a few of my highlight videos and he's like hey Stu I'll give you uh, 300 pounds to film my wedding in a few weeks and I'm like man definitely I'll do that for, at the time 300 pounds was like a lot of money to me so I went went along filmed his wedding and he really liked what I did and I met a female photographer there um, and she, I sent the highlight video to her afterwards. And then next thing you know, she's calling me up and hiring me, you know, to film weddings with her, you know? So mm-hmm. I just kind of, I pretended to be a wedding videographer when I really wasn't. I just make it up <laughs> as I go along. The next thing you know, I'm actually filming weddings to make a living. So that was a good thing because I really learned, I got to uh, understand editing and filming and different camera angles. So once I filmed quite a number of weddings, that's when I thought, like, how about I make some cool stuff with jiu-jitsu? You know, I knew at the time, I think it was 2011, 
uh, ADCC was coming to Nottingham and a lot of the high level athletes were coming over like Jeff Monson, Gunnar Nelson, Ryan Hall. So I took the opportunity to go to some of their seminars and film the seminars, just film the techniques, film people rolling, film them rolling with the students and then do an interview with them afterwards. And at this time there was no flow grappling and there was Budo videos, but they were more live stream events. Right. There was very little content on YouTube of like, you know, looking into, um, yeah, the personalities of these athletes, you know, and like document like that, just little short films and documentaries, like giving you an insight to how they train and, um, you know, what makes them get to that next level. So I made the first video on Ryan Hall, posted on YouTube, and it got quite a few thousand views. Wow. And then next thing you know, I did one on Gunnar Nelson, Jeff Bonson, and it seemed people liked it because there was not really much uh, content online like the, like, like the things I was filming. Yeah. Um, and then next thing you know, I'm, I'm in contact with Bradley Estima and he's got the, the super fight at Jacare coming up. So it was a friend of mine called Jason Tan, uh, from the MMA Academy in Liverpool. He co- put me in contact with Braulio and then we made the road to ADCC, uh, series, uh, for 2011. So I just made like a four part series, like showing Braulio training for the super fight with Jacare. And I became good friends with um, Braulio. And next thing you know, like, I'm getting the invite to go to Brazil. You know, actually, you remember, I always, like, when you start jiu-jitsu, that's, like, your dream to go to Brazil and train jiu-jitsu in the heart of Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. So I was, um, once I had a few videos online, I reached out to Connection Rio in Baja Tijuca and said, um, just sent him a few links to the videos I made and said, would you be interested in giving me free training, free accommodation? And in return, I'll, like, make some videos in Brazil and promote Connection Rio, put the logo in the beginning of the end, put sponsored by Connection Rio and advertise the hostel, you know, like this is the place to go. You can come to Rio de Janeiro, stay in this hostel for cheap and train jiu-jitsu. And he emailed me back. I think it was like in the next 10 minutes going, when do you want to come? Amazing. And I'm like, um, like in, in next month, he's like, right, I'd like I'll see you here. And that yeah. was it. It was like, I was 25 at the time. And just like that, next thing you know, I'm in Brazil. You know, uh, yeah, film and jiu-jitsu. And his name was Dennis Ash, who owned Connection Rio. And he had a lot of good contacts over there. So as soon as I got there, he put me in contact with um, RDA, Rafael Desanos, who was on the prelims at that time. He wasn't a big name. Yeah. So I did some uh, video work with him. Uh, Kira Gracie, uh, Husamar Harris. That's when Husamar Harris was like, <clears throat> everyone was scared of him. He burst into the UFC. He was leg-locking everybody. Yeah. So uh, these films, and then I actually finished ADCC Highlight that time as well. So it all happens so fast, you know. Jiu-Jitsu is exploding. Social media like YouTube, Facebook was exploding. So it's all like, you know, a lot of things happening at once. So yeah, it's kind of crazy how it happened, and I just kind of rolled with it. Yeah, exactly. You are in the right place, right time, and you were yeah. keen. Were you still injured when you were in Brazil, or is this like you were uh, getting no, back to stuff? Um, yeah, by the time I was in Brazil, so after actually I dislocated my arm as a blue belt, I got back training um, and I started competing again, uh, winning tournaments again. Then I got my foot broke in a tournament. So then I was out again, but that like, then I picked up the video camera again. So that's when I, I really started to realize like, right, if you get this many injuries, you know, you really want something on the side. Totally. You know? That's so smart. Career. And then I started to think like, I mean, even if I did go full-time jiu-jitsu, you need to have something after because a lot of athletes go through the career, but then it gets to the end of the career. What do they have afterwards, you know? So I thought it was a good thing to like keep keep doing, you know, just keep making these videos. Yeah, no, 100%. And with the way the world's going digitally now, you, you couldn't have picked a better medium because video is like the number one digital communication format, right, um, of all time. And, and I can't see it going anywhere, um, anywhere else. It's only, only going to go forward. So pretty pretty cool that you picked the one format which is like you know yeah. in demand and will be forever long after your physical days are are done for athletic prime in the jiu-jitsu mats yeah that's yeah. that's phenomenal what was the what was the first camera that you picked up was it a little handheld like... <laughs> yeah it was i can actually my I, felt, I found my first video online it was of a legato rodriguez seminar in 2009 and it's all pixelated it's filmed in four by three 
it's so bad <laughs> by the time like i thought it was great you know and the, all the people at the gym said it was great but looking back you see the quality is pretty bad but you can see there's something there you can see like i was editing the music i had some kind of natural talent there but after um i filmed that wedding with that 300 pounds i put that towards like a better a better video camera and then uh, I think my parents helped me with just a little bit of money to just upgrade because they could see that maybe this is something I can make a career in. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of the camp, what camera I had. But then um, the, the first good one I got was the, the Canon 7D. Um, yeah, the Canon 7D. So uh, the DSLR cameras, you know, where yeah. you really get that depth of field, that cinematic look. And they're perfect for filming things like jiu -jitsu. They're not good for like live stream events because they have like a 12 minute cutoff period. Right. But um, they're affordable and the quality is, is amazing. Yeah. And that was okay. The yeah. 7D. Yeah. Because I, I wanted to chat to you about the videography side of things anyway. We might as well tuck into yeah. it now and then we can maybe visit some Tiger stories um, yeah. after. But the, okay. So the Canon 7D kind of does what it, what it needs to, but not the streaming. And then. I suppose from weddings you found out like tripods and angles and all yeah. the kind of nuanced things you need to make anything look professional yeah. is that that's where you cut your teeth yeah and then... I think it's definitely something you have an eye for as well it's like, like I said like I'm not you know I'm not like good at maths I'm not good at science my you know going online and organizing legit travel logistics like booking a flight like my brain just doesn't work like that like I'm <laughs> You know, like at school, I thought there was something wrong with me. But when it comes to like other things, I'm like got this laser focus. So I just like, you know, it's definitely one of my strengths. It's like I was, I really excelled at arts and photography. Um, I loved watching films growing up. So I would just like watch films and I'd like take note of the camera angles. So a lot of the, the shots I get, like the focus pulls, the pans, I would, it's probably just stuff that I've t taken from watching films growing up. Right. Okay. So you actually yeah. actively sort out how the. Yeah. And I've noticed when I give my camera like to someone else, like I've hired extra cameraman over the years and like, oh, just like, just, oh, can you take a photo from me? And they're like, I get the photo back. I'm like, how did you think that was framed? Like, okay. Like that is a terrible shot. <laughs> but some people just, you know, but they maybe they're particularly good at something else, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, they haven't yeah, quite yeah. got the natural eye for it. Yeah, like my dad definitely does not have a natural eye for it. He takes a photograph, it's all wonky. It's like, well, how did you end up framing it like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. interesting. Um, yeah. Favorite camera setup currently? Uh, so right now I've got a Canon 5D Mark IV or 5, I think it is. Uh, I've still got the 7D and I've got a 6D as well. So I've actually got three D DSLR cameras. I've got two tripods so and I've got the, the tie mics, so like the microphone that fits on the top. So what I do, if I'm doing interviews, I'll film one, I'll have one camera going wide, one really, I like to do my close-up shots, really get those facial expressions, and I find it gives it a more cinematic look. Yeah. And then the other camera is just on like, a, I have it on like a glider, you know, so I can just like run around and just get shots, you know, just more handheld. So I like to have the, the tripod shots to get the smooth pans and the focus pulls, but I like to go handheld with some of them as well. So I really mix it up a bit. Yeah, and then editing wise, yeah, totally. Yeah. With yeah, just with wide and close, you can have yeah. a lot of combinations, can't you? And then editing wise, yeah. do you just chuck that on what software do you like for editing? <laughs> so that um, this would um, I would be considered a dinosaur for your like skilled uh, editors these days. I'm still using Final Cut Pro Seven, and when I tell that to some people, they're like, "How are you still?" Because this is an old editing program. Yeah, but I like it. You know, for the, the vid I don't do special effects <clears throat> or anything like that, so. Uh, the Canon, the, the sorry, the the final final cut seven, it works perfect for me. Yeah, that's interesting. Is I still use yeah. Photoshop CS five. Like I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care how old it is. It, it does, does the job, you know. It does it. And when you know wait, when you know way around a piece of software, that's the right? Thing. It's, I know it's my more way efficient. around. Yeah, yeah rather than I spending could. hours learning a new one. Exactly. That's my issue right now. I could, you know, I actually have these are already i've got final cut pro x i've got the new adobe premiere i just haven't got around to learning them yet because i know it's going to take a bit of time to learn the interface because it's completely different i actually tried to do it like the other week and i'm staring at it, i'm like i have no idea what to do here so i need someone to show me but uh, i'll eventually get onto that just taking my time yeah no totally and 
Do you have like a favorite kind of format, Stuart, that you like if you're doing the jiu-jitsu stuff? Because obviously your jiu-jitsu videos have had millions of views now and people know you, um, well, in two realms, I suppose, Stuart's jiu-jitsu and Stuart's filmmaking. And the filmmaking is yeah. phenomenal. You know, I've been watching your stuff for long before I've, long before I met you and I think lots of people are, are fans of your work. Do you have a favorite format that you like for making the jiu-jitsu stuff? Is it kind of like, do you prefer going to like the competitions, grabbing comp footage, overlaying some someone talking about stuff, or do you prefer, like you said, the more interview kind of close up facial expression stuff, or or do you just like it all? Yeah, so the way I've done it over the years, um, when I, I was fortunate enough to film ADCC 2011, uh, 2013 and 2015, um, and I always like, I'll focus, like, he's only got one camera and there's three mats going at once, but I'll focus on the matches, the people that I, like, who I'm fans of, like Gal Val, Husamal Pulharis, Pablo Popovich at the time. So um, when I was filming 2011, I was fortunate to get all of Gal Val's matches, all of Takino's matches. And when I actually went out to Brazil, I, there was Husamal Pulharis. So I actually had the footage of him. I'm like, oh, this is great. I can do an interview and ask him about ADCC. You know, about his performance there. Because there, there was a few controversial moments where he held on to David Abellan's leg. Oh, yeah, you know, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, I'm not sure it was a heel hook or a knee bar, but he screamed. And, you know, like I thought that would be a good, cool video to get him to talk about, you know, leg locks in ADCC, how he uses them for in, in the UFC, and give him a chance to explain, you know, why he held on. <laughs> yeah, because I seem to remember they reset that, but they reset the position with him in a dominant position yeah. or something, wasn't it? It was weird. I remember watching the match last yeah. year in lockdown and they, they moved them to the middle of the map, but they started pa uh, Palajares on the sub or something. He had the sub and then he wrenched it and then Avalon yeah, yeah. screaming. And I'm like, and at oh this God. time, I don't think we, he, he hadn't like had that reputation yet. He had a reputation to be a leg locker, but... Um, at that time he hadn't held on to too many submissions so i think if that was like yeah i mean if, if david avella knew <laughs> he wouldn't have like he would just all right yeah you win <laughs> right right oh i see what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah. he didn't have the rep behind after him that, he ended up like holding on to a bunch of the submissions in the ufc and then he ended up in world series of fighting and getting banned from mma actually he ended up going over to russia yeah, but I'm actually going to do um, a re-edit of that documentary. I have a friend called Mike Miller, uh, who's based in Rio de Janeiro right now, and he's friends with Husma Pulharis. Because Takino, it's really hard to know. I mean, like, people think he's a bad person, and he holds on to those submissions on purpose. But I've met the guy a bunch of times, and he's actually a really shy, quiet person. He's, like, super friendly. And when he walks out, you know, um, to the UFC fights, he cries, he's so scared. So I'm not sure if it's, I don't really think he's holding on a purpose. I think he's so scared, like he yep. wants to win so much and just think there's hundred live audience, hundreds of thousands of people watching live, well, millions around the world live. And he just, I think he just blacks out. This is my yeah. opinion. He blacks out and just holds on and starts wrenching it. I, I mean, I could be wrong, but. Yeah, no, there might be um, something to that because the pressure so, of fighting is extreme right. for one. The, yes. uh, people do black out and can't remember how they win or lose all the time. Yeah. Even me, grappling matches. After the match is over, I'm like, fuck, what happened? <laughs> yes, yeah, no. I've experienced similar. And then yeah. people are easy to um, assume malice, especially yeah. in the context of combat rather than, uh, yeah. you know, neglect, for example. It's, um, yeah. it's much easier to run the narrative of like this big, tough, and he's a big looking guy, right? He's strong. It's, yes. like, it's much easier yeah, yeah, to yeah. associate malice with someone of that kind of demeanor and build than it would be to say oh you know he's because you he wouldn't think he's a shy guy shitting his pants oh, you wouldn't looking at him looking guy. yeah like, you look at him you'd be like holy like, yeah like, tank. yeah you you wouldn't immediately think this guy's yeah. shy and scared you think no this guy's in here to harvest some souls you know it's um yeah, yeah. Uh, how interesting though from the inside yeah. perspective it might have just been done out of terror and not malice yeah, yeah. So this new video I'm going to be doing uh, on him is going to give him a chance to like talk about all this because he had to, he got a lot of hate online. I think he had to delete his Facebook and oh. some of his platforms because of the yeah. mouth. Like, when I like, I posted a few videos on my YouTube channel, you should see the comment section. They just tear him apart. So this new new video I'm going to be working on is just giving him a chance to explain himself. And I'm neutral. I don't, 
having sure. a picture. I don't You're know. You're the messenger, yeah. But at least give them a chance to explain and then people can make their own minds up. I think it'll be an interesting video. Totally. Yeah, why he, not? You know, he made a comeback recently. Just think how effective his leg locks were in 2011 all the way up to, you know, yeah, well, several years afterwards. But then John Danaher, Gordon Ryan, Gary Tong came in with these. They tidied up the leg locks. They really made him into these, like, systems. And um, Husmar Kelt came came back like a couple of months ago and had his first match was against William Tackett. But the game's changed. Everyone knows the leg game now. Yeah. And he ended up losing, you know, right. um, because it was so effective back then, but the sport's evolved and he's been out for a few years of competition. Right. Just goes to show how quickly, you know, the sport evolves and people learn, you know, the yeah. new systems. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah. yeah, once it's on the table. I've seen it with the X Games. X Games is a fascinating... Um, yeah case study right just skateboarding alone like where skateboarding was in 99 when tony hawk landed the 900 and then where it's come to now like you don't even qualify if you can't land a 900 now and there's kids right. you know like 13 14 just smashing them out 12 i think even it's like that's their that's their pedigree of knowing that they're going to make it one day is that they can land the 900 at age 12 now it's just like it's wow. absolutely mind-blowing that that was the pinnacle of existence at one point and it yeah. doesn't even hardly qualify you anything now it's um it's, and it's the same with combat sport, right? The evolution is, is clear. I think Palahares was one of the first guys to kind of start the Ashigarami reaping into inside position and cross yeah. Ashis, right? He was, the, he was one of the first to really do that. Maybe uh, not even knowing what he was doing in the sense of yeah. the pathways he was creating there. And then, you know, like you say, the Danaher boys came in and systemized that. But he was arguably one of yeah. the pioneers of of doing it. It makes you realize just how ballsy Gary Tonin is really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one of my favorite grappler matches ever. Even though my favorite, you know, just the way he, yeah, he wanted that match and the way he just came in and he, he actually heel hooked Husmo Paris twice. Takino just didn't tap. And apparently backstage he was limping. I bet he's had some popped yeah. ankles. Yeah. And that suplex he did yeah. on Gary Tonin was terrifying. It was terrified. Yeah. That just was mum like a baby. Oh, that was that made me yeah, that made me throw up in my yeah. mouth a little bit. I was like, oh my god, it's like <laughs> Randleman Fedor Part Two. Like this is yeah. this is crazy. Um, so at some point you managed to get out to Tiger then in Thailand. I think that's when I first came across your sort of profile and um, online presence and sort of videos and stuff was the Tiger days. How did the the Tiger realm sort of come around and how did you find yourself out there with the the golden era of Tiger Muay Thai? So after Brazil, um, I ended up um, meeting a guy called Patrick Vickers. He actually stayed at Connection Rio and he worked for Cage Warriors. So after Brazil, I ended up traveling, bouncing around Europe uh, with Cage Warriors and ended up going around US and Brazil a little bit more with Bradley with Steamer, like filming with him. Um, but then I've all, I always wanted to go out to Thailand. So I thought, hmm, like I, I, Tiger Muay Thai is such a big name, you know, and I, I think I've been watching some little videos of Tiger Muay Thai when I was at university. So I had the idea, what if I reach out to them and offer them the same deal like I did in Connection Rio in Brazil? So I sent them an email of like saying, how, what, what have, would you be interested in giving me free training, free accommodation? Here's some examples of my video work, you know, um, would you be interested? And unfortunately, I, I, one of my friends is actually out there. So next thing you know, they're like, yeah, when do you want to come? You know, <laughs> that was it. It was as easy as that. So I just ended up flying out to Thailand. And um, yeah, I just moved in one of my friends that I actually went to university with. Uh, he had a spare room. Um, at the time, it was, I wasn't getting paid or anything. It was just, just sponsorship, just accommodation and free meal plan and training. So I was getting free food as well. So I didn't really need that much money. But it didn't take long after a few months, you know, they actually gave me like a proper job, you know, I was like working in the video department. And at the time, Tiger Moita was big, but it wasn't that big, you know. Uh, it was growing though. Uh, Roger Huerta was the MMA coach at the time and Brian Ebersole. And those two really uh, grew the MMA program. They got, uh, encouraged a lot of um, fighters to come out from like Dagestan. That was my first introduction to uh People from Kazakhstan and Dagestan, I didn't realize how good, you know, those guys were, you know, right. I just, uh, MMA, wrestling. I remember going out there and, you know, it was a tough purple belt, I trained all around the world, I could hold my own. And I just remember getting ragdolled, you know, really, <laughs> like Khabib style by these guys. 
Wow. I was like, oh my God, I've never, like, where are these guys from? Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. from Dagestan. I'm like, how are they not in the UFC? And yeah. like, they will be, just watch. They, right, yeah. So yeah I was getting yeah. back, <laughs> back in like 2012, you know, so it's 2012 when I first went out to Thailand. Yeah. And I just fell in love with it. I actually went out to Brazil thinking, I'd fall in love with Brazil and that's it. I'm going to stay there. I'm going to live in Brazil. And I could have, I, I could have actually made uh, a life in Brazil, but it just didn't, I don't know what it was. It didn't feel like home to me. But when I went out to Thailand, it just right away, I just, I just fell in love with it. You know, I loved yeah. how cheap it was to live, accommodations, just a very relaxed lifestyle. You can train, you know, loads of like um, uh, people to film with, you know, loads of different high level athletes coming through. It was just a good lifestyle, you know? Yeah, totally. And you got English as a commonality in Thailand, right? Yep. If you're visiting, yeah. which is powerful. I mean, I, I moved there when I was 19 and similar, like there was all walks of life, but the commonality was English. And that definitely helps if you don't speak fluent Portuguese, I would imagine. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. the world in, I would imagine, I haven't been to Brazil yet, but I would imagine you need people who can translate for you and pull the connections and the strings to help you. Whereas Thailand, you can pretty much turn up almost yeah, solo yeah. and just with your English kind of navigate yeah. with the other people who have moved there, right? And build yourself a life. So maybe yeah. that was a, a strong factor, but yeah, I can imagine it was a, a very, a very nice way of life. And it seemed from the golden era that you weren't alone, you know, lots of people stayed there, yeah. right? And made their lives there for a few years. Yeah, because it was it's actually, um, I've got a good group of friends there and a lot of them are still there but because of COVID, a lot of them have actually moved away. So there was a, a good, like, solid group of people that were there from 2012 till, you know, very recently. You know, I, I was like back and forth, back and forth over the years, but some of my best friends, you know, uh, live there. But it seems to have come to the uh, comes a bit of an end over there now because of COVID. It's taken a big hit over there. Yeah. So there was um, the road that Tiger Muay Thai was on. There was so many like restaurants, coffee shops, other fitness gyms, Muay Thai gyms, CrossFit gyms down that road. A lot of them have closed down. So. So yeah. bad to call the tourists out. So, yeah, but it's always going to be a second home to me. You know, I, I, I'm looking forward to going back one day, you know, when all this uh, chaos is over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, revisit the nostalgia. And then now you're at Diaz Combat Sports in Vancouver. Um, so, yeah, how did that come around? And what's your kind of goals for, for that? You're obviously the head of the jiu-jitsu program there and everything's, it's a fantastic, you know, facility. I was actually, I was in Tiger Muay Thai up until 2015 and then actually went back to England for a year. And then I actually went back out to Singapore. I was in the, um, Singapore 2016 to 2017, teaching at Evolve MMA. Um, <laughs> I could not take it more than a year. I had to bounce from there quick. I ended up going back to Tiger Muay Thai and became the head jiu-jitsu coach, 2017 to 2019. Um, and then Ryan Diaz, um, who I met at Tiger Muay Thai in 2013, I believe, he had his last MMA fight in one championship at the time. And that's where we met. We trained together there. And we became friends. We stayed in contact uh, after he retired, after his MMA fight. He came back to Vancouver. He started uh, Diaz Combat Sports. And it was just a small, I think he was just renting a space in like a fit in 30 minutes, at, you know, to begin with. And then he just kind of expanded a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more from there. And then in 2019, he came out to Thailand. Um, I just messaged him going, hey, I'm in Thailand. Do you want to meet up, have a coffee? And then he actually walked into my jiu-jitsu class. Um, and like, yeah, we had a little chat. He goes, oh, let's go for lunch afterwards. So we went for lunch and he just planted the seed. He's like, what do you think about, how do you like it here? Would you be interested in coming out to Vancouver? I'm like, you know, I've always thought about like Canada or Vancouver because I love Thailand, but I didn't see longevity there, you know? I didn't see it as a place I could really settled down like for good i always saw it as temporary and um, so i said yeah i'd love to come out to vancouver goes, how about you come out for a month you know see if you like it so that's what we did you know next thing you know he's um I booked my flight to go up, come out to vancouver for a month and i wasn't sold in it at first because it was the old gym it was like a, um it was quite a quite a small gym and it was in a little bit of a you know a, a dodgy area you know <laughs> vancouver is amazing but you've got there's a big contrast you've got like you were like kitsilano west vancouver north vancouver and then obviously you've got like hastings and there's a big homeless drug problem so my first uh, impression of it was like whoa you know what what happened to vancouver you know <laughs> like, it's a little bit rough around here but then ryan like showed this is just one little part 
you know, and he showed me the rest of Vancouver and I'm like, it's, it's as beautiful as ever. You know, I really love British Columbia. Um, and he showed me the plans for the new gym. He goes, right, this isn't, this is like a temporary gym. We're actually going to be building this three story gym. And this can be a world-class facility. And he said that you can have your own jiu-jitsu program there. You can have the whole top floor and then, yeah, you know, like build it over the years. And I was like, right. You know, I still, I still had to think about it because I love Thailand so much. Um, but I was having a big problem with staff infections at Tiger Muay Thai. And unfortunately, there was new owners at Tiger Muay Thai. Um, and the current manager just did not care about people, about hygiene, if people were getting staff infections or not. He just didn't want to know about it. It wasn't the nicest of people, uh, you know, people at all. Um, so I already, you know, had one foot out the door because I think I had 10 staph infections in 12 months. I mean, I was on antibiotics for 10 out of 12 months and that really messed my stomach up like bad. Uh, not as bad as I, you heard about Gordon Ryan's stomach issues and that was because of staph. It sounds like he's got it really bad. Mine never ended up being that bad, but definitely messed up my stomach. And um, it's just not, not, antibiotics are not good for you. It kills all the good bacteria as well. And I'm like, and they start, I, I started to have to be on them longer and longer. And I'm like, right, this ain't good. You know, I was getting like a scalpel in my armpit, like this armpit on my shins, like every other month I'm getting cut into. And uh, the management of Tiger Muay Thai had no, you know, yeah, they didn't seem to want to solve the problem. And the problem was like the toilets were right next to the mats. There's a turnover of people every week, you know, and they don't really know what staff is. People go to the toilet barefoot, walk in the mats, like, yeah, it's just bacteria everywhere. Um, but I also, uh, I, when I, I went to Vancouver for a month, and when I went back to Thailand, I ripped uh, my, my meniscus. So that was when I, it, I remember going into the manager's office, and I'm like, yeah, I've, got the, I've told my meniscus I can't teach for the next four or five months. And uh, long story short, but he expected me to find a replacement and pay that replacement to teach my classes. Like, your own money insane yeah like this is the things are different in thailand <laughs> you never get away with that stuff over here so i was like all right see you later and I was, that's where i really made the decision right i'm coming over to vancouver for sure you know yeah the decision was catalyzed uh, for the better there. yeah i already kind of knew but that was it it was like he didn't know that i had other things to go to so right yeah, yeah he was like this is your only option mate so you'll figure it yeah, out yeah <laughs> good riddance to that guy and um uh, and, and recently all the other coaches left as well because of the same person you know? yeah so yeah you weren't you weren't alone something about the high turnover of people that seems to create mega staff too doesn't it the blue yeah. basement boys talked about that a lot i think with high volume of visitors yes something yeah. when you get a high volume of visitors you don't necessarily know what people are or aren't bringing onto the mats a lot of people because they're visiting want to train at all costs because they're invested, so they will cover up or maybe not be truthful yeah. of what they've got if this they is know. exactly what happened at Tiger Muay Thai. People come from Australia, US, wherever it is, and the first week, the train, they paid for a month, and, oh, they got staff in the leg, but they still got three weeks left. Right. And I think, I don't know, actually, I'm not even sure if they get a refund, but they just cover it up because they've only got three weeks left, just carry on training, and staff spreads very easily. So, yeah, it was just constantly going around the gym. Yeah, I can imagine in a climate like Thailand too, it's a fucking yes, turbo. Yes, exactly. the, the heat doesn't help as well. And now I've been in Vancouver for almost two years. I haven't had it once, not right. once. There you so, go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's something to do with the air climate and the, yeah. the high turnover of people. Um, on the meniscus front, did you end up having surgery or did you just leave it? No, I actually had to have surgery. So... Um, I was a bit stupid. I actually tore, I had a little tear in my meniscus before I went to that one month trial in Vancouver. And I couldn't train because it was like, it was popping in and out. And um, the physio said, just rest six weeks. You don't need surgery. It will heal. You know, it's not a bad tear. So I went to Vancouver for a month. And I, you know, as like, we love jujitsu so much, it's hard not to train. Even though you're injured, you just get that urge to train. And, um, I didn't train the whole time I was in Vancouver, but I went back to Thailand and thinking, yeah, I'm good now. I think I can train now. Nope. First roll on the first day back, I jumped in. Someone put me in a lockdown and I got arrived at cross face, tried to pull myself into mount as they stretched the lockdown. So what was a small tear ended up being a huge tear. 
and it ended up being a, a bucket handle tear. So the meniscus ripped and uh, flipped over and got caught in between my joints. Oh, God. So my leg was stuck at an angle. And I couldn't, they, they couldn't extend it. I couldn't pop it back in. It was actually stuck. So I had no choice. I actually had to have um, the surgery. So we had to make a decision. Do we snip it or do we repair it? And that was a, a tough decision to make. I actually made the decision on the operating table because we did the MRI. And from the MRI, he's saying, I recommend you get this repaired because if we remove this, you're not going to be left with much, uh, much meniscus at all from what the MRI is showing us. And I got a bunch of opinions from different people. And some doctors are saying, because they know what I do, they're saying, no, I was you, just get it removed because you're just going to rip it again. And other, other people, other doctors, other physios are saying, no, we reckon you should re repair it. You know, because if you do take it out, you're looking at knee replacement in five to ten years' time because it's going to be bone on bone. Yeah, it just wears down, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, what do I do? Because if I snip it, I'm back in a month. If I repair it, it's a year. But you could wait that whole year and it didn't work anyway. It's a risk. So you could, like, do all the physio, all the rehab, rest for a year. You come back, start training, and it wasn't successful surgery. It just ripped anyway, and you ended up taking it out anyway. So um i ended up taking a risk and said you know what let's try and save it you know and i'm glad i did that because my man it's fine now you know i have no problems with my knee at all so amazing yeah yeah but it was it was hard coming back from that though i was out definitely more than a year you know it was it was tough getting back into competition as well right you know? so yeah but it's all good now that's good and then i just wanted to pick your brain Stuart, on the sort of S and C side of, of training for jujitsu in the gym outside of the mats because that relates, I guess, kind of nicely to the, the yeah. knee, knee health and rehab pathway. So you said, you know, 16, you're kind of lifting weights and fucking around yeah. like most of us teenagers do. Yeah, do I was you... doing every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just try and get the gains. That's yeah. it. But regarding like staying healthy enough to be able to train in, in a sport that batters you so much as as jiu-jitsu can what's your kind of approach to to lifting and kind of doing gym work alongside of your mat time yeah so now i try and do um i try and do at least one 10k run a week you know preferably preferably two but it's sometimes hard to fit it in but i do cycle uh, to the gym every day so i do one to two hours cycling uh, most days so that's cardio there but i i don't think anything replaces running for cardio because you're actually carrying your own body weight, and it's uh, it's just different, you know. Um, and I, I lift um, like two to three times a week. You know, I used to do a lot of like um, you know upper body stuff, bench press, shoulder press, uh, pull ups, dips, more body weight stuff. But just from lifting the wrong way, doing too many high repetitions and too many sets like every day, and like when I was in my twenties, I've like developed arthritis in my elbow. I've got a few elbow problems. So I wish um, I had, I was a little bit more knowledgeable about lifting and didn't do so much of it. So I had more longevity. So now I don't really do too much upper body stuff. I do more like squats and deadlifts pretty much, you know, and I find that uh, that's something I ignored for years and I actually find I get a lot of benefit from that, you know, uh, just holding mount, you know, getting the body trying on people. Like I find now, like uh, I've been doing squats, my legs are so much stronger. It's made me stronger overall. Yeah, and what so, kind of um, what kind of yeah. squats do you like to do? Do you do like back squat, front squat? Uh, yeah, just put them on, on the back of my shoulders there. Yeah, sometimes I'll bring it on the front here, rest the bar on my shoulders. Yeah, because I can't, I can't get. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't got the flexibility. Oh, yet. there you go. Yeah, front rack's not going to happen. Yeah, no, my arms are just <laughs> Yeah, and then rep rep wise, do you like to do? What do you do? Fives, eights, threes? Um, I'll do three sets of. 10 to 12 to warm up and then from there like i'll do maybe five to six sets of like four to eight reps really depends you know yeah it depends how i'm feeling that day nice. some some days i'll do less reps like just like two or three but like really heavy yeah and other days like you know not too heavy but more like you know like eight reps or something yeah, yeah just do how i feel but uh, now i'm getting older i'm not like that that's why i'm just I don't think I'm really going to be doing much upper body weights ever again. I'm going to start getting into more of the yoga. So I'm trying to do a lot more stretching now. It's something I've always done is stretching, but I think uh, the hot yoga 
um, or just yoga in general, is something that's good to get into, you know, earlier on, just, just to prevent injuries. So okay. I think uh, if I had advice for up and coming grapplers, don't lift too much, you know, like I was, I was like lifting every day, but just doing mad reps and like too, too many reps and too many sets. I'm just burning my joints out, you know? Yeah, totally. I think if you're going to lift every day, you want to be doing few sets and reps. <laughs> and if you're going to lift infrequently, perhaps you can increase the yeah. sets and reps, but it's one or the other, right? And then I think like we were talking about the other day, what end of the spectrum of hypermobility or stiffness are you on? Are you a Gumby Ruotolo boy, you know, who's like super rubbery, in which case then, yeah, maybe you don't need to do 10 hours of hot yoga a week. Maybe you need to lift some fucking heavy weights and find out what your three rep max is. Are yeah. you strong Stuart Cooper and already, you know, pretty capable at shifting heavy weights? Well, then maybe you need to be able to touch your toes and fucking stretch out a little bit and complement what your natural attributes are with um, intelligent accessory protocol whether it's the yoga or whether it's the heavy lifting I think you've got to complement your jiu-jitsu um, extracurricular work with the opposite of what your attributes are naturally right we're on yeah. the stronger end of the spectrum stretching is good for us rubbery people they're on the stretchy end of the spectrum heavy lifting is good for them and so you've got to kind of balance yeah. all of those I mean the best I felt was doing lifting jiu-jitsu and then hot yoga to take everything back out yeah that would be a perfect yeah combination there that's a good recipe to follow i think so yeah i think that's got the most the most mileage yeah. just to avoid um overuse you know tendonitis arthritis those kind of yeah. things joint degradation that kind of thing um yeah. because you know lifting's fun like lift it once you it find is, yeah, the joy in it like lots of people say oh you know gym's so boring but that's because they haven't been coached or found the fun within lifting something fucking heavy or yeah. finding what their limit is there's a lot of joy to be had but on the other end of it if you're doing it in a non-intelligent fashion and it's fucking you up then yeah you're going to make a, a conclusion that it's either not for you or it's just a waste of time or whatever and i don't think that's that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. there's a lot of benefit to be had yeah. but it's easy to get it wrong right and very often in our younger years we smash it we go for it and then yeah. it fucks us up and then we're like oh you know not the best approach but yeah. that's encouraging there the squats i think squats is like your insurance plan i say it to a lot of my yeah. clients and a lot of my training partners and like the best health insurance plan you're going to take out yeah. is intelligent heavy squatting it's just yeah, and i ignored that for years i only started squatting maybe two years ago it was just all like upper body that's all i did for years you know <laughs> yeah the bro split yeah but you yeah, know yeah. i mean the, the heavy squats it's amazing how strong you can get in your torso for example just from back squats right yeah um yeah. and just even locking the bar down on your shoulders it's amazing how much arm strength you can generate just from locking into heavy yeah. full body lifts like like the squat yeah i'm a massive fan of back squat it's my i'm a i'm definitely a squatter over a over a puller but i think it's i think it's the best complementary exercise for, for yeah. jiu jitsu definitely for doubt. on the feet as well with takedowns i think it just makes you a lot stronger you know uh, for takedowns you get your feet planted in the mat more like you've just more spring from your legs totally yeah because you're understanding how to root yourself into the floor and then hold load right and it's yeah. like, well, what's wrestling? Wrestling is mostly done with feet on the floor. Um, yeah. And you're trying to get another person's feet off the floor. So it makes sense if you're going to use the floor to generate power that what you do in the gym replicates, you know, or strength or power, it replicates that. And the back squat is just that, right? You're rooted into the floor yeah. and you're, you're managing load. It's, it's, it's magic, yeah. I think. You just have to be intelligent on the programming. And that's where a lot of people fuck it up. Yeah. I think is they get the reps and the sets wrong but if you can get that right that's your health insurance yeah and right yeah. there one thing I like to do is do like the, the the heavy squats and then immediately follow it up by like jumping like box jumping like something explosive so you're going heavy and then you're exploding yeah contrast contrast training has yeah. got a lot of exploration possibilities in the grappling world I think I'm very interested in um yeah, there's a lot of room for that. I know William Wayland at Powering Through in, in Chelmsford in Essex. He's uh, Arnold Allen's S&C coach from the UFC. He's big on contrast. Um, and there's, a, I think, a Serbian guy, Molden. I'm going to butcher his name now. But 
the strength prep manual guy. I want to say Molden Djokovic, but it's not Djokovic. It's something like that. He's big on that contrast idea. Yeah, one heavy compound movement, squat, deadlift variation, straight into an explosive movement on the same vector. So if you're back squatting, straight into like, yeah, a box jump. Or if you're um, doing a bent over kind of, or even like a vertical pull, like a, a chin up, and then straight into like a overhead throw, or you're matching the line of force with something explosive straight after. I think there's a lot of a lot of room for that on the contrast sort of power, strength and power front, but you can also use it for the alactic energy system for conditioning too. So doing yeah. like repeated efforts of six seconds, 20 seconds off, six seconds, 20 seconds off. There's a lot of room for that. Yeah, I think that's really, you get a little bit more athleticism expression, don't yes. you, pairing yeah. those two together. Um, and I think for the nogi side of things, that is probably yes. the way to go. But now I know that the Danaher boys, this is what's really interesting to me, is you get Nicky Rod, Creninston, Nicky Ryan and Gordon Ryan, or, you know, whether they're on the gear or not, who cares? But they're fans of like the four sets of 20 and they're right. all doing the 20 rep method. Yeah, they do. They just like Gordon's whole ADCC, let's put on 300 pounds in a week kind of pro protocol was all done with, well, yeah, arguably Chinese milkshakes, but four sets of 20 on everything. Yeah. And that's like, that's a completely hypertrophy based bodybuilding style workout. But right. they're looking at it from a strength endurance perspective, or maybe they're not, but it creates strength endurance, right? Which yeah. you would, you could argue is more of a gi quality because gi is a lot more friction based and you're you're holding tension in positions for much longer but then you look at someone like gordon ryan he's self-confessed non-athletic right he's not a powerhouse he doesn't explode he's got he no really got, really explode, does he? he's no. not got he hasn't got fast twitch really going on in his fiber types he's a slow twitch yeah. kind of guy so maybe for the slower twitch people the four sets of 20 is the way to go but for you, yourself myself a bit more mixed fibers or fast twitch fibers something like a heavy lift contrasted with an explosive movement is is the way to go yeah there's a lot to a lot to play around there it's really cool um Stu, i know you've got loads of stuff cracking on the last little bit i just wanted to chat to you about because i think it's really interesting we've had some great chats so far is the psychedelic front we've talked about the the back squat as the health program or health insurance if you like for grapplers but i yeah. think there's a health insurance for the mental side of things too yeah. which is starting to get some light and i wanted to talk to you a little bit about your you know your sort of experience with psychedelics and kind of um how they've helped you with various things and maybe we could dive into you know how you first came across the psychedelics they've helped me so much i wish i you know yeah I'm, it's kind of good you know i like the journey i've been on i discovered them at the right time uh, maybe if i discovered them earlier it wouldn't have worked to me as much but yeah when um the lifestyle i was living traveling the world I was constantly on a plane, you know, like film, like going to Miami, then to going up to Oregon, then to Ibiza, then to Switzerland, then to Thailand, then to back to Sao Paulo, to Rio, back to freaking Miami. But at times over the years, my schedule flying around the world filming was crazy. Right. So I started to self-medicate with diazepam at the time. And I didn't really, I was like 27 at the time. I was very ignorant. I wasn't I didn't know how dangerous these drugs were because in Thailand, you just buy these things over the counter. It's like 50 baht for a pack of 10, which is like nothing, you know? And then that 18 hour, 24 hour flight journey, it's like five minutes, you just pass out. Oh, are we there? Oh, that was easy. <laughs> wow. Because I was doing this regular and these things make you feel like shit the next day. But if you wake up feeling like shit, just pop another one. Oh, you feel good again. <laughs> so right. this is like a vicious cycle I started to get into. I was unaware of what was actually happening. Yeah. So um, I actually got a, a addicted to, I became very dependent. Only if, uh, addiction is when you keep chasing a feeling, but it's always followed by negative consequences. Right. So at the time, the diazepam actually wasn't having too much of a negative effect on my life. You know, it was actually kind of helping me at the time, but I would never encourage it. They're so hard to get off. Probably the, one of the most dangerous drugs on the planet. It's probably the hardest to get off, harder than opiates. Um, but I never really abused the diazepam. I was only taking one or two a day, but for several years. 
Wow. Um, and then I actually got um, a knee injury and I started taking tramadol, which is an opiate. So I was mixing benzodiazepines with opiates, <laughs> and then, um, which is a deadly combination. And it was actually a doctor prescribed this to me. At one oh point, my God. Which I don't even know how that doctor has a license. Yeah. You should, even if you Google diazepam and tramadol and look it up in the internet, it says major interaction. Like that's, you can die in your sleep. It's, you know, not a good thing to be doing. Wow. So I'm doing this. It ended up like with the opiates. Like I said, I never really abused the diazepam too much, even though I was taking it every day for probably three or four years. Yeah. Uh, I started messing around the opiates. <clears throat> um, like one became two, two became three before you know it. I'm taking a high number of those things just to function. <clears throat> so um, at first, like it wasn't, you know, I wasn't having a negative effect impact on my life. But then after, you know, as the, as the dosages started to go up, my appetite started to go down. I started to, it really, they change your personality. I started to become a different person. Wow. Um, yeah, it's a, a lot, a lot of it is a bit of a blur, to be honest. I bet. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and I just, my physicality started to decline because I've always been quite a stocky person, you know, like uh, I think I must take after my mom. You know, I was uh, when I was in Thailand, I was like, when I was a purple belt, when I actually discovered these things, I was probably like 88 kilograms. Yeah. And then after taking these opiates every day, um, I think uh, by the time I was 30, I dropped down from 88 kilograms is about 195 pounds. I went to 155 pounds. Holy shit. And I was a, then I got my brown belt and I, I went from being a good purple belt that would give black belts a hard time to a brown belt that was getting tapped by blue belts. <laughs> and people that would usually like, you know, I had a reputation for being a, a tough role. And then next thing you know, I'm just getting tapped all the time. Wow. And people around me were like, you know, is everyone, everyone all right with Stu? Because he's not the same person. And uh, my professor at the time in Thailand, it wasn't my, my professor's Lucio Sergio, but there was another black belt in Thailand called Fernando Macachero, who's a good friend of mine. And he, like, he noticed it. I remember him pulling me aside and Roger Huerta as well, who used to be in the UFC. Both of them pulled me aside one day and asked me if everything's okay. But if you're, when you're an addict, you lie to yourself. You're like, yeah, yeah, everything's okay. You know, you literally like, you don't think there's anything wrong with you. Right. It takes something big. And that's what happened to me. I remember being in Australia. That's when I realized I had a problem because I ran out of a supply. Oh, there you go. My body went into withdrawal. And I wasn't actually sure. I didn't know it was withdrawal at the time. I just remember starting getting brain zaps. I started to sweat, like flu symptoms, but worse. Right. And then I realized, oh, I actually don't have uh, any diazepam or tramadol with me. And then I, I went on Google and looked up withdrawal symptoms. And I, I just I knew exactly what it was. I was going through two types of drug withdrawals at once. So I quickly Jesus. got on a plane back to Thailand. And that was the worst flight of my life. I'm trying to hold it together on this flight and I was so uncomfortable and dripping with sweat just trying to act normal <laughs> I get to Thailand and then go in a pharmacy get a bunch of these pills and next thing you know boom I'm back I'm like right I got a problem here right. so I had to call up my folks back in England and then um, yeah tell them the truth of what's going on and it was very hard for them to hear it because I've always been into sport you know I've never been into drugs yeah. you know it's just something that happened you know um so I had to go back to England. This was 2015. I took a year off and uh, my parents, you know, helped me detox off these drugs. And that was the hardest year of my life. It was, it was so uncomfortable. I can't begin to explain, you know, but I managed to get through it. Um, it took me a year to slowly taper off both drugs. And that's the way to do it. You don't want to just, you can't go cold turkey on diazepam or Xanax. You have to slowly taper down. I think with opiates, you could old cold turkey i wouldn't recommend it it could be dangerous it's better it's definitely better to taper off right it's gonna suck no matter what um and after a year i finally got off everything i think it was december 5th 2016 no 2015 i was off everything yeah um, and for seven, seven three months went by and i'm clean i've not got any drugs in my body but i'm still suffering with i'm still suffering with like the uh the cravings, you know, I'm, I, I go through two types of withdrawals. There's the acute withdrawal and then the post-acute withdrawal. So the acute withdrawal is the first few weeks to a month of like the sweating, the brain zaps, you know, the body shakes, the muscle aches. It's awful. And then once you get through that, 
it takes a long time. It could take a year, two years for your for homeostasis, your brain chemistry to rebalance. Right. Um, and that's what, uh, when you actually have the post-acute withdrawal syndrome, which is also known as pause. And that consists of like depression, um, just brain fog, like chronic fatigue, just no motivation. Because your brain, like I've been putting like drugs that hit the GABA receptors, the serotonin receptors, the dopamine receptors. So then your brain stops producing it. So when you stop taking these drugs, it takes a while for your brain to start producing the normal levels again. So I remember, I think it was January, February, March, um, March, 2016. And I'm just still struggling. I'm going to bed, having dreams about going in a pharmacy in Thailand. Oh my God. And I got a job offer in Singapore of all the MMA. And I'm like, fuck if I, I'm not ready to take this job, I knew what was going to happen. If I go out there, I'm just going to relapse. So I started looking for cures, you know, on the internet, cures for addiction. Right. And I came across ayahuasca. And I, I heard of ayahuasca from, you know, Joe Rogan podcast. And I just thought it was some psychedelic you do for fun. I didn't really know that there was a lot of healing benefits from psychedelics. So it definitely never ever do ayahuasca while you're taking drugs it could actually kill you it give you serotonin syndrome but if you're actually being off drugs for a long time and you're still struggling it could definitely help you you know but right. uh, That's definitely important get advice. <laughs> yes yeah if you're on antidepressants and you were to go and do ayahuasca it, it could actually kill you you know so you actually have your body has to be you have to do an ayahuasca diet so i managed to find um, a retreat in denmark um and just by chance, I remember emailing them. Uh, I don't even know how I found it. It was just, just rooting around the internet, Facebook groups. Um, and they had someone drop out. Um, and a three, three weeks notice. And I thought, fuck it. Like, like I might as well try it, you know, because I was just a shell of myself. I, I was willing to try anything to get my life back and just get rid of these cravings because I did not want to relapse. So I ended up paying, I think it was 350 euros um and i started doing the ayahuasca diet which was like brown rice broccoli and you know vegetables like pretty much no caffeine no tea no stimulants nothing Flew out to denmark uh went to uh met a bunch of people at copenhagen you know, airport i didn't know what was going to happen like because you got to be careful about these things there's a lot of fake shaman out there there's a lot of supposed ayahuasca retreats i had my wits about me because i don't know who these people are Yep. In the back of my head, I was thinking this could be like, you know, the Wicker Man. <laughs> it could <laughs> be gonna, like, I might, I might be a sacrificial lamb or something, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm already like just to fuck some people up. But <laughs> I get there, I quickly realize now this is legit. And there's like 18 people there. There's uh, two shaman from Peru, a bunch of shaman apprentices. You sit around in a circle the first day there. And it's on an island called Fimu. So we went to Copenhagen Airport. We drove three hours to... Um, uh, this ferry point it was a two-hour ferry ride to this island called Fimu, and only 100 people live on this island wow. and there's no police or anything so it's perfect to do an ayahuasca ceremony <laughs> it's kind of illegal you know yeah um so yeah the first night they give us one glass uh, we sit around in a circle you, you you don't have to say why you're there but they give you you know you introduce yourself say what it is you're hoping to overcome it could be depression it could be anxiety it could be addiction i was the only person there for addiction issues oh really yeah, yeah, no one oh, else. Was there. Other people there just for curiosity, you know. Okay. Just, yep. Yeah, or uh, some people have an interest in past lives. I've never had these experiences. I'd love to, but I never have, you know. Um, wow. So I was the first one to go up, uh, drank my glass of ayahuasca. The first night's more of a tester to see how you react. And the first night was amazing. Um, it was just nothing but a positive experience. I was on the toilet a lot. And then the next day I woke up feeling a lot better. I felt good. I didn't have, I woke up, I didn't have any cravings for any drugs or anything. Wow. But I still was tired. I still not, not myself. And then we drank, it was two nights, the Iowa, two ayahuasca ceremonies. And then the second night they said, right, we, re- we think you should go further tonight. We're going to give you two glasses. I'm like, all right. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Whew. Two glasses were way more powerful because the first night was a powerful experience. But when I opened my eyes, everything's still there. I'm still seeing my hands, the, the room's still there. But when I had the two, the two glasses the next night, when I opened up my eyes, like, the room is full of geometric patterns and it's just <laughs> you're seeing yeah, reality differently. And it was a very powerful, one of the, probably the most powerful experience I've ever had. It was, it was amazing. And I really can't put into words what happens. It's like we don't have the language to yeah. describe to someone what happens. 
And I don't know, I can't explain how ayahuasca works, but just that weekend I was back. Like I, I arrived there a shell of myself, just depressed, no motivation, no energy. And I'll go back to England, go back to my parents' house. And they saw like, you know, the spark mad, the color in my face. They saw me happy, they saw me smiling. They're like, what, what happened to you this weekend? You seem, you seem different. And I, I couldn't explain to them, I'm just, they don't even know what ayahuasca is. Right. So they're like, what happened this weekend? I'm like, because I didn't know I went to Denmark. I told them I went to London just for some filming job. Uh, okay. I'm like, oh, I just started doing some breathing exercises. I met a girl. You know, that's all I could think of. I'm like, all right, because <laughs> they weren't ready to hear it. Sure. And then the next weekend, I went to Spain and did another ayahuasca ceremony. But nothing actually happened. Right. I did, the, I did two, two more ayahuasca ceremonies, but nothing happened. And I think it's because I rushed into it. I'd already... I, I was good you know like and that i think that was a lesson that this kind of my personality i always rush i always feel like i'm going to fix myself you know like i need to see do more and do more yep. so i think maybe that's why nothing happened but i did do a couple cambo ceremonies and then the weekend after that i did a san pedro ceremony and yeah it, i was good for quite a long time you know and it was uh i ended up going out to singapore um meeting the current girlfriend that i have now um, I was there for a year, then went back to Tiger Muay Thai for a couple of years and then ended up in um, Vancouver. And since then, it was during the lockdown, I started to mess around with um, just other things again. I started to notice the old, I thought it was cured from addiction, but honestly, I don't think I'll ever, I think I'm always going to be an addict. I think that's just the reality of it, but I know how to manage it. I know, I know, I recognize, I know myself a lot better. I know when the old me is coming back. So I noticed the old me coming back in March this year because I started to mess around with crates. And I always told myself I'll never take pills again, which I haven't. But um, I started to justify taking things like Carver and Kratom. Uh, and Kratom is a natural opiate, you know, and it hits the opiate receptors. So um, basically, I just kind of rewired my brain again. You know, I started to get the cravings back for the opiates again. So I know that if there's one psychedelic that really hits hits it on the head, addiction, it's ibogaine. So if you are an opiate addict, I would say instead of doing ayahuasca, go and do ibogaine. So I wasn't allowed to do a flood dose. A flood dose, I'm not sure how many grams it is, but uh, a flood dose will immobilize you and put you in a deep psychedelic state for anything between 24 to 36 to 48 hours. You're just lying on a bed and you're just in this, you're in another place. Uh, but it can, it can be very dangerous. It can lower your heart rate, lower your blood pressure. And because my resting heart rate is 45, I wasn't actually allowed to do that. Right. So um, I, I emailed, um, I can't remember the name of the website, but you actually had this gentleman on your podcast, Gareth Mo Moxie. Moxie, Gareth yeah. Moxie, the English guy. Yeah. I reached out to him and um, I went to meet up with him and he explained how they do Ibogaine. They do a smaller dose every day, spread out over two weeks. So that's pretty much what I did uh, with Gareth. And at the end of the two weeks, you do something called 5-MeO-DMT. Because the eye begins quite dark and dull, but a, a lot of stuff does come up. And one thing that really uh, I got a lot of benefit from was <clears throat> I never understood why I got addicted, you know? And they say that all addiction comes from trauma. And I, I just, I come from, I've got a good family. I was never abused from my family or anything like that. I, my mom and dad are great, you know? I'm very lucky. But I was like, I don't think I've got any trauma. Why would I get hooked in these things? <clears throat> it turns out like, I think, I think all of us have trauma, you know, I agree. in some level. Yeah. 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 So the um, mind definitely, I, I was able to realize where mine came from and a, a lot of things that really like so much made sense afterwards. Why I, I took up jujitsu for a living, you know, cause I come from, you know, Preston is not a nice place. You know, <clears throat> I went to a school called Priory high and just the fret, you know, you, you fight all the time. You know, there's, there's always the every day walking home from school, you're getting in fights. You know, it's just, it's like the thing you do there. It's like when you get into your 18, 19, you go out in pubs, yep, bars, you just fight. Someone's looking at you, what are you looking at? You start fighting. You know, it's, yeah, just, it's a very British cultural thing. It's bizarre. Yeah, I think that's why I don't really like England and I'm probably not going to go back. I just don't yeah. like the culture over there, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally so, understand. Um, but I was at, like, a lot of my trauma came from the high school I went to, uh, not just from the kids, but from the teachers as well. You know, and just, yeah, things that were done to me, said to me, and it kind of made a lot of sense afterwards. So, yeah, and I actually did the Ibogaine, the 5-MeO-DMT in March. So I took the whole of March off in 20, uh, 
what is it, 2021, isn't it? Yeah. 2021, yeah. yeah, this year. Yeah. Um, and then, then yeah, that was, that was a very, that was a great experience for me, you know. I got a lot from that. And since then, I've been kind of been dabbling with microdosing uh, psilocybin, you know, and wow. LSD. And it seems to, yeah, it seems to really work for me, you know. Because yeah. uh, at school, I think one of the reasons I studied, uh, struggled at school is I have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And I know psychedelics like microdose naturally helps people with OCD. Um, so because people with OCD, their brains don't produce as much GABA or serotonin, you know, so <clears throat> which is why like you get a lot more anxiety. So uh, microdose and psilocybin just gives you like a little serotonin boost. I wish I had these things in school because I would have listened a lot more, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I seem to microdose. I'm having a bit of a break from it right now. I kind of do like six weeks on, four weeks off. Yeah. Just allow everything to reset. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, now have I noticed the old me coming back, you know, I just, I know what to do, you know? Yeah, it's great. You've got a protocol in place. So for when that rears its ugly head, you're not stumped by it, right? You know what to right. enact, what to do. A yeah. big, a massive part, like you say, of, of addiction is recognition. Yes. It's just conscious yeah. recognition that you have the addiction. Like most things that you solve in life start with an awareness of the fact that something needs solving. That's what it is. It's an awareness. Yeah. It's admitting yeah. to yourself. You know, that's that, that was the turning point for me when I was in Australia. When I first went into withdrawal symptoms, that was the moment I'm like, fuck, yeah, I'm an addict. Yes. I'm, I'm actually a drug addict. You know, because <laughs> yes. I was lying to myself for so long. You know. Yeah, which we can do. Some people can do forever, and some people we can yep. go so far. But shock. Shock usually usually creates change, or at least I think that's its purpose in nature is to create some sort of change. And the awareness of discovering that you're an addict is quite shocking yeah. um, in lots of ways. It can be. And I think, uh, you know, for someone who was conscious like yourself and wanted, or genuinely wanted to fix yourself, that shock produced the change for the better, right? It was the catalyst for yeah. starting the process of fixing this. Um, and as we've, you know, myself as well, we've both learned in our older years as we get older and wiser psychedelics have been there since you know before we have probably and have been used for as long as we've been here to help with things yeah um and they're older than civilization itself so it's nice to know as we get older there is a protocol we can use and there's a helping hand available in these compounds if we yeah. use them smartly to help steer and navigate these darker territories of ourselves and you know, circumvent our uh, addict behaviors and really keep us on the path to actualizing ourselves as opposed to lying to yeah. ourselves, right? And they're finally getting legalized in a lot of states in America now. Here yes. in Canada, I think they've decriminalized psilocybin. I'm not sure. It's kind of a gray area, but you can just go in a shop. I know two, no, three stores in Vancouver. You can just go in there and buy microdoses, buy a big bag of mushrooms over the counter. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's different in Vancouver. Yeah, it's available. So, uh, more so yeah, the stigma is getting removed, which is great. Yeah, finally, yeah. I think that's, um, that's, so, that's so key because one thing that especially drug addicts already have a lot of is stigma. <laughs> Being a drug addict is already littered yeah, with stigma. Yeah. So to find the solution to be stigmatized as well is not the best. So it's about time that these things started to get um, yeah. the, the, the sort of recognition that they deserve. And I'm, I'm stoked that you've had a positive personal experience figuring all that out and you've come up with yeah. your own protocols and methods to help yourself you know what's kind of crazy is i got addicted to pills that were prescribed to me you know that are legal they were given me by a prescription right but and they almost fucking killed me you know yeah to get off them i had to do something illegal and break the law yeah to basically fix myself and get my life back yeah. so that there's a big there's there's some problems with the system that we have you know i just can't i can't wrap my head around why these things have been illegal and why ibogaine is still illegal you know when it helps so many people on opiates like rehab has a 95 percent relapse rate from what i understand and ibogaine is a 95 percent success rate actually, <laughs> if, if i if i'd known about ibogaine i went through one year of withdrawals from the opiates if i had known it's about ibogaine that one year of misery not only for me for my family as well they had to watch me go through it. they weren't sure i was going to come out the other end wow. you know uh, they weren't sure i was going to relapse but that one year was miserable that could have been crammed down into two or three weeks of ibogaine and it resets the opiate receptors cleans them out and you skip you don't actually have withdrawal right. you don't have drug withdrawal but it's illegal to do that so 
I, I can't, I don't understand why. Yeah. Why it's illegal. You know, who knows? Yeah, there's, there could be a million one reasons from yeah. conspiratorial to financial but regardless the fact remains that it's out there and it's available for people so if you're listening and you're struggling with those kind of issues those are the things yeah. you want to be looking into because and always got... do your research first never rush into it you know because yes. there are some interactions with a lot of the psychedelics there are some dangerous interactions like things you wouldn't even think of like ibogaine if you're taking ibogaine you can't drink uh, grapefruit juice <laughs> Right. It can kill you, you know, so it's, right. it, you have to be a professional and you have to be very honest with that professional about your story or the drugs you take and how long you've been off them, you know. Yeah, totally. You've got, yeah, you've got to be willing and ready to expose yeah. your, <laughs> your darkest yes. secrets, right? I mean, Gareth is a fantastic yeah. chap. I really enjoyed chatting yeah, to him. He's, awesome, Gareth. Yeah. he's in the British Columbia area. If anyone's listening from there that's struggling, he's... um. Yeah, he's a inner great, realms is his website inner in, realms inner realms great yeah. he's a he's a great first person to speak to and maybe if you're not from that area but you want to chat to someone who could advise i would probably put you in touch with him too because he knows he knows the pathway and he's um he's gone through his own fair share and is now experienced as a almost what i'd call a a neo shaman in many ways you know he's 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 um he's figured out how to help others in the best possible way with these compounds right in a safe a very safe way which is yeah yeah he does great. it the safest way possible actually the way he does it is probably going to the way they're going to be doing it in the future it's because right. like i said the flood dose could be very dangerous the people have died from it you know? yes totally it's not to be uh, fucked with and i think culturally no. it comes from a a place you know in, in the african plains where it's right it's designed as a rites of passage to put you out for two or three days and yes yeah. reset you and if you can handle that welcome to the tribe kind of thing right it's no joke yeah. so you've got to go with someone who knows what they're doing <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. one thing though since i've done the ibogaine um my ocd symptoms never really came back you know really? i've always had like these just these obsessions and these compulsions but um, Gareth even told me that he said that you'll probably notice that a lot of these your OCD symptoms just disappear, but they may come back in time. Right. So far, they actually come back. So interesting. Yeah. I wonder. Uh, how interesting. Yeah, people with ADHD as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder how much of that is civilized trauma induced, and then I wonder yes. if that's the eye yeah, yeah. that's resetting that. It's very interesting if it comes yeah, from. It's a, fascinating, isn't it? Really if fascinating. It's, if, yeah, if they're not genetic issues, but they are civilized nurturing issues, then why the ibogaine hits that? Yeah, that's a fascinating area of the discovery and research I'd like to know more about. And perhaps, you know, that's going to come to light in the next few years as as these yeah. things are more permissible in terms of study, right? I, I wonder. Um, Stuart, before I let you go, what else have you got coming up there, mate, in the next couple of months? What's on the agenda film-wise and, and training-wise? So, uh, actually, this Friday, I'll be going to Mendocino, California. I'll be teaching at the Grapplers Retreat uh, for a week. And then after that, um, I'm going to bounce around the U.S. I'm going to do a Grappling Industries tournament in Portland. Um, and then I'm going to probably go to San Diego, I think, and try and do some film with the Rotolo Twins. Cool. Uh, that's something that uh, that's that's the next video I'd really like to do. You know, there's a few people on my list. Um, I would have the plan was to move over this part of the world and make loads more videos, but COVID happened, so that kind of <laughs> prevented that from happening. But now things uh, travel is becoming a little bit easier. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely going to be uh, carrying on making a lot of more videos. I actually have a bunch of stuff I've never released, and it's I've actually edited a lot of it. Like I'm working on a piece of Andre Galvao. And I was going to release it, but now he's taken on Gordon Ryan. Um, there's more of a story to be told. So um, I need to meet up with him and talk about him, what he wants to do and see you know, know how if we can really make this into like a feature documentary. Yeah. Because you know, I've always made short films, you know, like I think the longest thing I've ever made, like 20 minutes, something. But I wouldn't mind making something, you know, like, like a proper feature length documentary. Yeah, I think that'd be fantastic. You, you've got all the skills and the eye for it, I think everyone would love to see that. Um, Stuart, if people want to see more of your stuff and you know check you out on social um, and YouTube and stuff, where, where can they find you? Uh, they can look me on Instagram, it's Stuart Cooper Films. Um, on YouTube, it's the same, Stuart Cooper Films. You can also follow my Stuart Cooper Jiu Jitsu Instagram page. Um, yep, if anyone's ever in Vancouver, yep, come down to Diaz Combat Sports. You know, We've got uh, daytime classes, evening classes, so yeah yeah it's an amazing world-class facility 
Fantastic. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing your your insights and your darkest addiction um, stories yeah. there, mate. I hope this is I hope touches the hearts and minds of people that listen. It's been a wild, wild eleven years <laughs> since I yeah. left. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and all the, all the great, power too. Even though like there's some dark times, I don't regret anything. You know, it's all it's all character building. <laughs> totally. Yeah, it all all builds the metal for sure. So yeah, yeah thanks for coming yeah. on the show and. And no, sharing pleasure. the story, man, and, and we'll get this out, and hopefully it can uh, can help some more people. Yep. No. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Speak soon. Yeah. Speak soon, mate.